reflective and ruminative temper of mind, a mind keenly almost, well, almost obsessed with the transcendence of life, with heroism, with being dignified in the face of defeat and hopeless combat. Just off the coast of Northumbria is Holy Island, the site of the monastery of Lindisfarne. The conversion of England to Christianity was a cultural revolution which gave the language some of its incredible richness and power. The monks who illuminated these manuscripts here at Lindisfarne found their vocabulary enriched by gospel words from Latin and Greek. Words like altar, angel, martyr and psalm. But in the year 793, this flowering of Anglo-Saxon culture was cut short by a second great invasion. This is how the beginning of the Dark Ages was recorded in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. There were terrible lightning storms. There were on Ormete Ligraskas. And fiery dragons flew through the air. And where on ye see one a furna drachen on nam luft a fleogende. Heathen men sacked God's church at Lindisfarne. Heathen raman a hergung a diligod, Godes churikan, in Lindisfarne. The Danes came year after year. By 870, all the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms had fallen. The English had been driven back to a small corner in the southwest, their language faced with extinction. The young king of Wessex in the south was England's last and only hope. He, of course, was Alfred the Great. Reduced to hiding in the marshes of Somerset with a small band of followers, Alfred showed brilliant leadership. He raised a new army and won a stunning victory over the Danes. By defeating the enemy from the north, and bringing peace to the south, Alfred saved not only his own kingdom, but also the English language. Now he set about uniting his people by appealing to a shared sense of Englishness. He commissioned the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle and encouraged the use of English for writing as well as speech. His achievement was unique in Europe and he is called the Great, an honor given to no other English monarch. England became divided along lines that are with us still. Alfred and his heirs ruled in the Saxon south. The Vikings settled north of a line agreed by treaty in the Danelaw. To this day, the north of England is richly carpeted with thousands of former Viking settlements. Even the fishing huts on Holy Island recall the shape of the Viking longships that, according to the chronicles, darkened the lives of the English with slaughter. The evidence of the Viking is everywhere, but one puzzle remains. Despite Viking rule, we know that Northerners speak English, not Danish, even though their countryside is still scattered with Norse names. A thousand years later, near York, in the middle of the old Danelaw, the postman still delivers letters to places of Norse origin. Many of the names are based on simple Viking words. Toft, for a plot of land, as in Lowestoft. Thwaite, meaning a clearing, as in Micklethwaite. Thorpe, for a settlement, as in Gowthorpe or Yulethorpe. He passes the beck, Viking for stream, into a village called Kirkby. B means a farm. Kirkby means the farm by the church.
Today, the postman is visiting a farmer of Norse descent named Erwin Bealby. The postman speaks with a typical Yorkshire accent. Oh, Erwin, how are you? How are you? Very well, and yourself? No, but middling. I don't like this cold weather. Erwin Bealby speaks a much older and stronger Yorkshire variety of English. What are you broke me this morning? You seem to have a fairish layer of stuff. Yeah, well, there's a variety in there. This feels like a beer. Oh, well, I'll let you up me and see, aren't I? That is Any I'm middling a walk to the Irish, so I'll let you get on. See, see you. It's very difficult talking folks dialect because they don't know what you're talking about. I mean, you've only to take village that I live in. And there, uh, there's that many fresh folks come to live in come out at towns, you know, and what what we call off Cumdens. And the grand folks, but of course there isn't jobs for folks around here, and they're, uh, they go to work at towns, into city, into York. And uh, of course, if you were to talk to them in dialect, they wouldn't know what in the world you were talking about. Erwin Bealby's conversation is riddled with Viking words, like adle, meaning to earn, you're going to uh, do a job because you want to earn some money. You want to addle some brass, as we would say in Yorkshire. Mun, it means you must. And laub, well, it means to jump. Laub toward the yacht, jump over the gate. A stop is a gate post, you see. Well, your, her bag, is the udder of a milking cow. Milk cow. To tear emptying, pouring, or anything, you see. You tame your book, it into its sile. It's a strainer, is sile. And you sit on a little three legs still and get your head stuck into the hard cool side. By God, it was a grand job on a frosty morning. Erwin's surname, Bealby, is Norse, but he actually lives in Bolton, which is Anglo-Saxon. Names ending in ton, like Malton and Pocklington, are typically Saxon. So are place names ending in Wick, Ing, Ford, and Borough, as in Pulborough. Like the Viking names, Anglo-Saxon endings are also descriptive. Tun was an enclosure. Ham was a town. Stead meant a site. Stow, a place, often religious, and wold meant a hill. Here in Yorkshire, the postman's mixed bag is a clue to what happened to the language in England when Viking and Saxon lived side by side. Professor Tom Shippey is a Yorkshireman who is fluent in Old Norse and Old English. He has studied what happened when the two languages came face to face. We're up here where Wharfdale meets Langstrothdale. It's a very mixed area linguistically. You get pure English names like Buckton and pure Norse names like Starbottom. And you get mixtures like Kettlewell or Hubberholm or Jochenthwaite. It's so mixed, and they're so close to each other, it makes you wonder what language they were talking in this valley back there a thousand years ago when the Norse were beginning to come in. Consider what happens if Jochen's son from Jochenthwaite, call him Rap, comes down the valley and decides to marry an English girl from Buckden, call her Edith, and they decide to set up home over there near Hubberholm. 